Hi, I'm Rabbi Pini Duna. Welcome to my Erev Shabbat Dvar Torah. Today, I'm going to share some history with you. You know I love history. In the first century of the Common Era, the two main centers of Jewish law were the academies of Hillel and Shammai, known as Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai. The Talmud tells us about all the disagreements that they had. Do you know how many times they disagreed about Jewish laws? 316 times. Now let me give you some facts. In roughly 80% of these disputes, Beit Hillel ruled leniently and humanely, while Beit Shammai ruled harshly and quite strictly. The debates between these two academies range from the most arcane laws of ritual purity to banal issues of seemingly no importance. And Beit Shammai is always tough, and Beit Hillel is always humane. Let me give you one example. In Ketubot, Beit Shammai rules that if a bride is ugly, it is against the halakha to say that she is beautiful on her wedding day, even though there is a halakha that one must make a bride happy on her wedding day. But Beit Hillel disagrees. And the logic behind their ruling? They say that every bride is beautiful on their wedding day. Here's another interesting fact. Beit Shammai never conceded to the views of Beit Hillel. But on many occasions, Beit Hillel conceded to the views of Beit Shammai, not coincidentally, perhaps, when Beit Shammai had reached a more lenient decision than them. And now I'll tell you something that you really didn't know. There was a point during the last few years of the second Beit HaMikdash when it seemed like the stricter views of Beit Shammai would win out. They were strongly supported by the radical Pharisee group known as the Kanaim, the Zealots, a violent isolationist group intent on ridding Judea of the Romans. But ultimately, and from a historical point of view, unusually, the less dominant group, Beit Hillel, prevailed, and today we enjoy the benefit of a Judaism that has adopted the halachic conclusions of Beit Hillel in all but a handful of cases. Now, you might think that this bottom line has to do with the fact that the Jews of that particular period in history didn't want to keep the stringent laws as interpreted by Beit Shammai. But you're wrong if you think that. The Talmud in Erevin explains why it was that Beit Hillel prevailed and Beit Shammai was marginalized in terms of Jewish practice, even if their views remain part of Jewish legal studies. Here is the quote from the Gemara. Rabbi Abba says, in the name of Rabbi Shmuel, For three years a debate raged between Beit Shammai and Beit Hillel, and both argued that the law should go according to them. Yatza'a bat kol v'amra. Elu ve'elu divrei lokim chayim ve'halacha k'beit hillel. Then a heavenly voice called out and said, Both are the words of the living God, but the law has to go according to beit hillel. So the Gemara then asks the following question. If it is true that both houses articulate the words of the living God, how is it that the halacha was decided in favor of beit hillel? answers the Gemara, because Beit Hillel were kind and modest, and they studied their own words as well as the words of Beit Shammai. And another thing, says the Gemara, not only did they look at what Beit Shammai said about any particular topic, but they would focus on Beit Shammai first. The Gemara concludes with the following amazing observation, and this is my translation. The reason why the Halakha is like Beit Hillel is to teach you that anyone who humbles himself, God will elevate him. And anyone who elevates himself, God will humble him. And anyone who pursues greatness, greatness will flee from him. And anyone who flees greatness, greatness will pursue him. It would seem from this Gemara that it wasn't inher an inherent truth or superior proofs that propelled Beit Hillel's halachic rulings to the fore, nor was it the lenient style of their rulings. Rather, it was the humility of Beit Hillel that won them the day. And can I add, that's lucky for us. Okay, very nice. But I still have two questions about this Gemara. One regarding the assertion of Beit Hillel's humility, and one regarding the general rule that concludes this piece of Gemara. 
My first question is this. The Gemara begins by telling us that Beit Hillel and Beit Shammai argued for three years about who should prevail. Did you hear that? For three years. Doesn't sound very humble to me. We know that Beit Shammai weren't humble, but it seems like Beit Hillel weren't very humble either. Because had they been so humble, after a few weeks they would have said, Do you know what, Beit Shammai, you really want it? You can have it. We love you and you're very great and we concede to you. God bless you. But no, for three years they argued, refusing to give in. And had the heavenly voice not intervened, for all we know, they would have argued for another 50 years or maybe a 100 years. Where exactly is Beit Hillel's humility? And here's my second question. Truthfully, it's more of an observation. The Gemara says that anyone who humbles himself, God will elevate him. And anyone who elevates himself, God will humble him. Anyone who pursues greatness, greatness will flee from him. And anyone who flees greatness, greatness will pursue them. So hear this idea. Anyone who wants to be elevated, just act humble. The more humble you act, the more likely it is you will get what you want. And if you want greatness, run away from it and it will chase after you. The Gemara is giving great advice for someone who's ambitious, no? But excuse me, how does that make any sense? I think that the key to this puzzle can be found in Behalotcha. During the episode of Miriam talking to Aaron about their brother Moshe, the Torah tells us, Moshe was exceedingly humble, humbler than any man on the face of the earth. The context of this pasuk is so that we should know that in no way was Moshe offended by anything his sister had said about him, and that her punishment was not was a result of her sin, not because she was because Moshe was insulted. But the problem with this pasuk is that the person who wrote it was Moshe himself. How exactly does, does that make any sense? If you want to say that he was simply taking dictation, perhaps, from God, but he was very humble. Just look at what he writes in Devarim. There will never arise another prophet in Israel like Moshe, who knows God face to face. Does that sound so humble? It doesn't sound very humble to me. And what about the episode of the golden calf? Moshe says to God, Erase me from your book. If you don't forgive the Jews for their sin, take me out of the Torah. I don't want to have anything to do with it. To me, that sounds like the height of arrogance. Take me out of your book. Who cares about you, Moshe? We're dealing with existential issues, the future of the chosen people, not your fragile ego. The truth is, none of this is as puzzling as it sounds. Let me share this story with you. In the 1930s and the 1940s, the head of the London Bet Din was Rabbi Cheskel Abramsky. He was a Talmud of Rav Chaim Soloveitchik, imprisoned by the Soviet authorities for teaching Torah in his hometown of Slutsk. The entire Jewish world worked for his release, and he was eventually released from jail in 1931 on condition that he left the Soviet Union and never returned. He moved to London, and within three years, this immigrant rabbi, who barely spoke English, rose through the ranks to become the head of the London Bet Din, one of the most prestigious rabbinic positions at that time. In the late 1930s, there were some so-called kosher butchers who were selling non-kosher meat and calling it kosher. The London Bet Din took them to court to remove the kosher label from their businesses. As the head of the London Bet Din, Rav Abramsky had to testify in court. It was a seminal moment. To start off with, his attorney asked him to state his name and his position. My name is Dain Yecheskel Abramsky, and I am the head of the court of the chief rabbi, he said. The attorney then asked him, what are your credentials, rabbi? Rav Abramsky replied, I am the greatest halachic authority in Europe and probably in the world. The judge was quite taken aback by this answer, and he interjected, Rabbi Abramsky, is that not rather arrogant on your part to say that you are the greatest halachic authority? I thought that your religion teaches you to be humble. Without any hesitation, Rabbi Abramsky responded to the judge as follows. Your Honor, he said, I know 
we are taught to be humble. But am I not under oath? You see, Moshe was humble. In fact, he was the humblest man who ever lived. But he did not suffer from low self-esteem. He knew exactly how great he was, and that his authority and his prophecy was of the highest order. But he also understood to the core of his being that his authority and prophecy did not stem from his own strengths, but was there by the grace of God. So in terms of ego, he had nothing. But he certainly did not hold back from asserting himself when the situation demanded it. It was important for the Jews to know for all time that humility does not mean that you are a shrinking violet. When you are right, say so and don't hold back. Beit Hillel did not believe that Beit Shammai was right just because they studied their words and gave them space. Beit Hillel were willing to fight their corner for three years and perhaps even for 50 years if the situation demanded it. Such was their confidence and their self-assuredness. But it wasn't arrogance. They were nice even when they were firm. They were kindly even when they refused to give in. That is the paradigm for the Jewish people. That is the paradigm for Judaism. And that is why we celebrate Moshe's humility. And my friends, that is why our halacha follows Beit Hillel today. So many Jews make the mistake of being frightened to stand up for what is right. J Street is so busy feeling sorry for the poor, downtrodden Palestinian that they forget that it is us Jews who are the real citizens of the Holy Land. We are so busy wanting to integrate ourselves and ingratiate ourselves with the secular progressive liberal left that we don't realize we are ingratiating ourselves into oblivion. We confuse humility with low self-esteem. We need to inherit the mantle of Moshe and the legacy of Beit Hillel. Stand firmly and squarely behind our principles without being arrogant or egotistical. Thank you so much for watching and let me wish you Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos.